Good morning. Um, I'm here today to talk about some of the books that I have been reading over the last month or so. Some of these are books I trailed in January. Um, I read them. Um, I am now uh, trying to work out what I think about them. Some have stayed with me more than others. Um, so let's jump in. Uh, so I was reading the Goldsmith shortlist in January. Um, one of the books on this was Hot Milk by Deborah Levy. Um, I thought this was one of the best books that I have read in a long, long time. Um, it is a, it's a coming of age story, it, it, which is something that I'm interested in generally at the moment. Um, it's about a young girl who follows her mother to Spain to help her recover from what seems to be a psychosomatic illness that prevents her walking and means her daughter has to look after her um, uh, pretty well full time. Um, it is a fascinating book. Uh, I guess what, what excited me so much was the way that Levy uses um, a range of interconnected images to um, build this very complex web of uh, psychological connection. So the book is called, is called Hot Milk, which is, uh, was deliberately intended, I was at a talk Levy gave, was deliberately intended to um, suggest something a little bit a little bit icky, a little bit unpleasant. Um, and that milk um, connects through the book into images of motherhood, um, of breasts, of, uh, um, of, of the marble that the clinic that the mother goes to in Spain is connected with. And there are also images of snakes, of medusas, of, of unpleasant mythical uh, connections to women. The book moves between Spain and Greece um, and I loved it. I thought it was a, I thought it was a fantastic book. Um, I think I would have given the Goldsmiths Prize to this book um, but that's Hot Milk by Deborah Levy which I highly highly recommend. I also finished reading Rachel Cusk's Transit which I talked about a little bit uh, in my first video back in January. Um, this actually has stuck with me more than I thought it would when I first started reading it. Um, I found it uh, quite, I felt that it, it stayed at a real, a real distance from, um, from the reader. And it is, it's a strange book. It, there are many chapters where, where the um, protagonist um, finds herself uh, meeting a particular character and the whole chapter is about that character telling you about their life and then it's the end of the chapter that's sort of the end of that character you move on into the next chapter where another character does the same thing um, all the characters who come in seem to speak in a very similar voice despite the fact that they're of di different nationalities different backgrounds different interests and I found that I found that quite strange and it gave a it gave an odd flat feeling to the novel as a whole um, but as I say, it then, it then stuck with me. There are images that come out from this novel um, and it's beautifully elegant prose that, that, I, that keep coming back into my mind um, over a month on. So Transit uh, by Rachel Cusk, um, probably a better novel than I thought it was first time round. Um, I'm surprised to say that, but, uh, but yes, Transit Rachel Cusk. I also read in a very, very different vein, and this is not on the Goldsmiths list, um, Toby Litt's Lifelike, um, which is a book of short stories. It is, um, so Toby Litt was one of the Granter 10 best novelists um, back at some stage, I'm not quite sure what date that was. Uh, he teaches uh, creative writing at Birkbeck in London. I found his blog a while ago, which I was very excited by. He writes about writing um, in a, a much more precise, exciting, engaged way than a lot of the people on the, on the internet who write about writing. And this is a book of short stories. He's a, he's a very pro prolific writer. Um, and these short stories, many of which have been published and have won prizes in all sorts of places, are an interconnected set. So it's almost like, um, it's almost like a game of dominoes. Each uh, each story has a character in it from the previous story and then another, a second character who then links into another story later in the book. Uh, so you have these sort of uh, connections that run all the, way through the, all the way through the novel. The stories are all in different formats as though Lit is almost trying to test out every possible way of writing a story. The ones that excited me most 
were one which is a a conversation with a psychoanalyst so and it's something I've tried to write a few times and, and so far failed at uh, it's what is being said within a single psychoanalytic session but it points forwards and points backwards to everything else that is going on in the life of the person who is having the treatment um, it's a very very clever very clever piece there is also an extremely clever piece which is just a couple of pages long and is simply the itemized bill for medical treatment received by one of the characters and by reading through the various items on the bill and taking what we already know from this character from an earlier story in the book uh, again we get a, a very detailed emotionally touching story about what has been going on in this character's life uh, just literally from these from the tight items on the on the medical bill that she's received so very very exciting book in terms of different ways of telling short stories very very clever and i will continue to read toby lit to find out um, more about the different things that he's testing so toby lit who also teaches creative writing at birkbeck it makes me tempted once again to go to birkbeck and do a creative writing course I also went down a rabbit hole. Um, I tend to do this. I, I find a, a single book by a writer and I tend then to go away and read almost everything uh, by them. So there will be more Toby Lit coming. But the, the rabbit hole this month was Charles Bukowski, who I have to say I'm ashamed I'd never heard of. He is a uh, American 20th century writer, famous for his alcoholism, um, famous for writing an absolutely vast amount. I said Toby Lit was prolific. Uh, Bukowski is incredibly pro prolific, uh, famous for never really editing what he wrote. So part of his writing advice is don't edit, just keep writing, just keep sending things out. Um, you might argue that that's not great advice, but it seems to have worked for him. So I read first uh, his, a selection of his writings on writing, um, pulled from uh, all sorts of letters and also little from his novels. The strap line on the front is do some living and get yourself a typewriter as a as a way to uh, start writing so it's one of those writing books that doesn't say you need to have read a vast amount it doesn't say you need to be hugely educated it says everybody has something they can write about it's critical to do it honestly and and to have lived something first so he is very much not from the school of creative writing mfas uh, he is from the school of having done an awful lot of uh, unpleasant, low status jobs, and he writes a lot about those. Uh, so Charles Bukowski on writing. And then the rabbit hole I went into was beginning to read his novels. So I read a novel called Post Office uh, on, on the Kindle. And I also read this, this novel, Ham on Rye, which was loaned to me in a rather battered copy by a friend. And this is a fictionalised version of Bukowski's early life, and it's a horrible, um, horrible early life, horrible book. Uh, it's, um, it's about a, a violent, abusive father, it's about loneliness at school, it's about a, a drowned, downtrodden mother and families uh, during the depression in the 30s, uh, and um, and starvation and unemployment and th there's a whole lot of very unpleasant stuff going on and yet Bukowski is a, a very sarcastic very witty uh, writer some parts of the novel are genuinely funny some parts are deeply deeply touching his uh, uh, the characters Hank's common-law wife uh, ex-partner um, Betty dies partway through uh, the novel and it's it's desperately painful despite the fact that you can see that the relationship was was faulty from the start so ham on rye and the later novel in this in this set post office i strongly recommend as a way of understanding a particular american stream of literature which is sometimes called grit lit uh, at a particular point in history um as i say new to me, exciting to read, and I will learn from this in the way that I write. And finally, the novel I wanted to, um, oh, the, the book is not a novel, the book I wanted to talk about most today is called Once Upon a Time in the East, A Story of Growing Up. 
I'm not going to attempt to uh, pronounce the author's name correctly. It's a, it's a Chinese name. Look, there it is. Um, it is. It's an autobiography of a woman who grew up in a small Chinese village by the sea, having been adopted effectively by her grandparents. She grew up illiterate in an illiterate village she, in the 70s. She later moved to live with her parents in small town communist China and then won a place to study film at the Beijing Film Academy in her 20s. So she studied, she studied there for a number of years and then she came to the UK on a scholarship, uh, studied film in the UK in a completely different way, uh, taught herself English, stayed and again became a, a granter best novelist. Her writing is astonishing for someone for whom this is the third language but then you would expect that given the awards that she's won. But what excited me most about this was the sheer range of experience she has gone through over the 40 years that this book covers, all the way from effectively a medieval experience in a, in a subsistence fishing village, uh, speaking a particular dialect, completely illiterate, with many women in the, in the village not even having names, through the great communist experiment, if that's what you want to call it, uh, of the of the 70s and 80s in small town and factory China through to the beginnings of an underground artistic movement in Beijing uh, in the 90s and the book covers Tiananmen, the Tiananmen Square massacre in 1989 as well and then through to a completely disorientating arrival in the UK um, in her late 20s unable to speak the language at the fringes of UK society living in effectively in poverty in the UK but seeing all of that through the lens of someone who grew up in China. The other the other piece I should say about this is that it it talks a lot about the abuse she suffered. There's a, there's a theme in the book that I'm talking about today. It talks a lot about the abuse she suffered in her childhood at the hands of her mother and at the hands of uh, men she met um, and the there is, there is zero self-pity in this. There is no self-pity in the Bukowski either, which is part of the reason why that's an exciting book to read. There is no self-pity about the experiences that she suffered. And yet there is complete clarity in saying, this is what happened. This is, what, this is how this shaped me as a person, as a writer, and then ultimately towards the end of the novel, as a mother who is going back to make some sort of peace with the China of her childhood and youth. I, I thought this book was fantastic. I imagine it will be widely read and reviewed. It, was, it came out uh, a month or so ago, widely read and reviewed over the next few months. And I highly, highly recommend it if you're interested in China. It's been described by many people as a, a 21st century wild swans. Um, there is a lot in that. It's a very different book. It's a more literary book. It's a better written book. Uh, but I, I thought this was an absolutely excellent and utterly fascinating book. So that's, that's books for today. I hope you enjoyed hearing about those. Do come back next time and hear about what I've been reading in uh, late February and early March. Thank you.